welcome to Films and Stuff with your hosts, Pete Mitchell and Ethan Hunt. Pete, welcome back. Films and Stuff, new day, new episode. How are you doing? I am great, Ethan. How are you? I'm good. I think we had a busy week. We caught up on Andor, episode 10. We had the premiere of Black Panther, Wakanda Forever, which we'll talk about in a subsequent episode. And we had our watch party for Amazon's The Peripheral. Yep, that's absolutely right. And for those of you who are new listeners, welcome. But every Friday, Ethan and I host a watch party on Amazon Prime. We send out links every Friday. We aim to start at 6 p.m. London time, 10 p.m. Dubai time. We'd like you to join us. We watch the episodes together. We discuss what happened on the episode. We have a nice chat about it. And we look forward to the next week after. Yep. It's BYOB. Okay. You mentioned the peripheral in our watch party. Should we dive into the peripheral and what happened this last episode, episode five that we watched? Absolutely. For those of you who aren't in on what's going on in the peripheral, the very quick recap is that Flynn, played by Chloe Grace Moretz, Mm -hmm. has access to this VR device, VR slash AR device, that actually connects her to a robot in the future. And she can control that from the past. And we won't get into too much details as to how this works and what the effects are. It's irrelevant at this point for that. But she's been tasked to do a mission for these people who hire her from the future. And Mm -hmm. that is to find out to what happened to one of their, let's say... Colleagues. Colleagues slash gang members slash whatever (laughs) you want to call it. Alita is her name. Alita, who's gone missing. Exactly. So the big, big, maybe not reveal, but the information we finally got now... In this episode five was we know that Alita stole something. We didn't really know what it was though, right? So now we've gone back and we see that, and tell me if this is right. I'm going to summarize what I got out of it. Pete, you tell me if if I am picking this up correctly. Alita knew this Dr. Grace Hogard, who is a scientist at the Research Institute. Apparently, Alita and Hogard went to university together, and they had some type of romantic relationship. It ended. Grace moved on with her life. She's got a husband and kids, and she's a scientist at the Research Institute. Alita wants to somehow find out what the Research Institute is doing, although I thought that she also works there. But she reaches, she does in a different department in a different department. So she somehow gets wind of like what's going down on this lower level. She knows that her old lover Grace has some involvement in it. So she reaches out to Grace and says, "Hey Grace, let's go get a drink." They go get a drink. They have some wine. They get a little bit giggly and flirty. And Alita says, "Hey, why don't you show me your office?" Right, Grace. And this is where. Am I am I on the right track so far? Yeah. Okay. Grace decides, hey, why don't I just take this lady after hours on a tour of this top, top, top secret area and basically spill all the beans about how it works and what it's doing, right? Mm-hmm. Okay. So they go down there and Grace says, hey, this is what we call, what do they call it? The God font? Yep. That's exactly right. And it's like this green crystal pyramid or something. And basically, what I understand that this can do is it can go in the past. So it's kind of a time machine. And she says that they're running like 8,000 studies in like different stubs, right? So which are different like past. Universes. Right? Yeah, past different paths. Universes. That's right. Okay. So... Alita is like totally freaked out about this. She's like, wow, you can't experiment on humans, even though they're in the past. And let's talk about how that works in the future. 
And that's where Alita now gets it in her head. This is very dangerous technology. I've got to destroy it slash steal it, right? Yes. So th- this is the, I don't know what I'd say. This is the the fundamental. This is the MacGuffin. This is right? the MacGuffin, this is right? the yes. thing that everyone is chasing after. Yes. And somehow Alita has apparently managed to steal it. Correct. And if you remember, that is yep. what Alita did with Episode Chloe one. Grace Moretz in what? the beginning of the Actually, very with episodes. her brother. With her brother. Well, with episode. her brother's yeah. body, but yes. it was her doing it. That's right. Correct. So, can we, before we move on to the rest of this episode, do you think it makes sense for you and me to just try to understand a little bit more about the relationship between the past and the future and this, I guess, stub thing? So I had a few things that I thought were a bit plot holish. Yes. But I think I understand where they're going with this. The idea is that the world as it stands today mm-hmm. is let's call it the central timeline, okay? Or let's call it the 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 prime timeline. Okay. For prime time. For argument's sake, okay? Okay. And they they've experienced some kind of huge natural disaster. Correct. And so they're now in the process of kind of building society back up. Okay. And in order to do that most efficiently, most effectively, and fast, what they've done is they've invented this device that can go back, not just in time, but they don't want to do it in their own timeline, in the prime timeline, because if you change your own past, you don't know what's going to happen in your future, right? Yes, Marty McFly. It would affect your pre- it would uh, affect your present. This is the same back to the future logic. Yes. So, what they've discovered though is that there is a multiverse and that time branches out and that universes branch out based on, you know, any number of things and this machine can access the timeline of other branches. Can I just make a pause here? I don't understand that. You're saying there's a central timeline, right? Yep. Okay, you go back in time and you're saying, I don't I don't want to change anything, right? So we're in 2022. I want to go back to 2021 when we started this podcast, right? And smash your microphone so that you can't speak. Okay? If I go back to 2021, I smash your microphone, then this podcast doesn't exist. Your microphone doesn't exist, and I'm just talking by myself now, right? Exactly, in 2022. Okay. Does my life in 2022 continue? Like, am I going on and I'm in 2024 now? But that's the point is you don't know that. Yeah. And they don't want to risk because they don't know what would happen. Right. So how do they create a, how do they create the stub, this alternate? Yeah. So they explained that in episode, I think two or three. I can't remember. They did mention it. But, and and don't hold me to this, but I think the idea was that every action and every decision Mm -hmm. results in a branching timeline. Um, That makes sense. So I go and I go back to 2021. I smash your microphone. That results in a new timeline, right? Or vice versa, that the decision that you have to make is where you, so it's either a yes or no. Right now, Mm. we're in the prime timeline. You said no. And that's why 2022, I still have a microphone. Okay. However, in an alternate timeline, you said yes. You smashed the podcast, uh, the time, uh, my my microphone, yeah. and that created another branch. So they do the testing on the other branches, not on their current timeline, because they don't know what would happen in the present. So it's a it's a very elegant way to test technology and do experiments with real world results without affecting your own timeline. Yes, but it would affect the Pete and Ethan. Of course. Right? But why would the Pete and Ethan of this t- timeline care about what happens to the Pete and Ethan of another timeline? Yeah. That I mean, was the That's why that Russian guy, question. that's why that Russian guy Killed exactly. all the other Russian guys of him in other exactly. timelines. He's like, I don't want them to potentially suffer, right? 
or he's just like, I want to be the only one that exists because he's got a huge ego. And that's weird to like have an ego against yourself, but I get but the that, point. But that's my point. So yeah. the point is that this becomes, I guess, like, you know, no, very Nolan-esque. Yeah. This is the moral quandary yeah. that this experiment poses. You're right. And the research institute doesn't care about the moral quandary because they're mm-hmm. only interested in getting results for their current timeline. Okay. And everybody else be in other timelines be damned. Mm-hmm. Right? Okay. Which is why, and we saw that in episode, in this last episode. Mm-hmm. Flynn and Burton and all these guys who are working for this group in the future are basically their pawns yeah. in the past. And so that's why she's kind of, like, that's the struggle that they're having right now, is how do we rectify that? Why do you think it's so important for Sharice and the Research Institute to kill Flynn? No, well, at this moment, is up until this last episode, they yeah. thought that she had access to Alita or stuff. that she had the yeah. data. Mm-hmm. She had the data or she had the, the technology to get access to the God Fang again. But wh- but that still doesn't make sense, right? Then they would want to take her alive. They wouldn't want to kill her. If she has it and it's missing, you would think that if they just ki- if any of the groups that they hired to kill her would have taken her out, they'd be like, great, now she's dead. We still don't know where it is, right? Well, I agree. I agree. And I think we'll learn more about that. Which is why Wilf at least is making a little bit more sense where he's like, hey, we need you to tell us where it might be, you know, like. Yeah. No, and I don't disagree. I don't disagree. I mm-hmm. think this is just a, A, it's a plot contrivance. Yeah. And B, I think it's also something we'll learn more about over yeah. the next couple episodes. What I like about this show, it wasn't until episode five that we get the backstory of what's going on for this series. Mm-hmm. We had four full hour-long episodes before we learned what, why we're here. And I yeah. kind of like that, right? It, it, it was an elongated flashback. Yeah. I mean, what I like most about this is how it's split between kind of the, the near future and the way, way future future. I like this yeah. dichotomy of the two different worlds – like that's really compelling to me the the flipping back and forth. I have to say typical uh Nolan this is uh like sometimes the rules seem to be made up a little bit as he goes. I mean, yep. I know it's not easy because he is making up the rules. He's writing a story, but just in terms of how still kind of the stubs work and again, how you can go back into the past and have the past be communicating with the future, that just doesn't really seem to make sense, right? Like, unless you're just saying life is like this big loop and you can just go back and then it's just playing out. That seems a little bit strange. And another thing you and I have noticed is that for people in the future, and even Flynn has pointed this out, they seem to know a lot of stuff, but they're not very good at like predicting important details, you know? Yes. And I, so I, the reason I thought about that, by the way, so that's what I was thinking was, I think the reason I understand that or the reason I can justify that is because they're they're taking a guess as to what's happening in another stub. And because they don't have access to that full data anymore because of Alita stealing it, I think they're having a hard time actually figuring out exactly what happens. Yeah. I'm not saying that's a good example uh, uh, explanation. I'm just saying that's the most reasonable one that I could understand. If there's because the scientist, right, Hogard, she said that they were running eight thousand different studies and stubs. So mm-hmm. let's let's assume that they're not running one study per stub. They're running multiple studies and stubs, right? Just mm-hmm. to make it easy, let's just say there's ten stubs, right? How did Wilf and the Russian know, or how did they care, to go reach to this particular stub and choose Flynn? So I think what they had been doing was, remember in the first episode, we see them play that VR game? Yeah. I think that game was how they selected her. Okay. Because she was the only one who reached level 100. Yeah. So I imagine, and again, this is me maybe reading too much in between the lines. I imagine they had that AR and VR game running in all the stubs to see 
if there was anyone who could get to that level, and Got she it. was the first one. And I guess they have the ability to go. I mean, we don't really explore time travel, right? We see this god font, but we don't really see how this works. Yeah, no. I mean, we don't know anything right? about how it works. So, I mean, they must have like some machine or something, right? Because they've created, as you and I mentioned. Because they're not sending anyone through time. Yeah. They're sending data streams, right? Yeah. They're sending information. It's actually the opposite of how, remember the Terminator, they would, the future, remember the machines, sent yeah. the, the Terminator and they're like, look, yeah. we can't send metal. We can't even send clothes, right? Because everyone ended up naked. So they yeah, it has only to be organic material. Yes. And now they're saying, which is a little bit more realistic, hey, we can just send text message. Zeros and ones, basically. Yeah. Right? So they're saying, okay, so we're, but again, you and I overthink it, but that's why we have this show, right? Yeah, exactly. How exactly? So they're like, hey, let's send this pair of VR goggles and make sure that some company sends them to Flynn, right? Mm -hmm. Or who they think is Flynn's brother. How does this work? Like they just. No, so they didn't send the VR goggles in time. Right, but they, they sent, sent the instructions to make it onto the 3D printer company. The cool. 3D co printer company printed yeah. it out and sent it. So they just basically sent like a, a purchase order, like Blueprint. an invoice, and say, hey, dear company, please he print this and send it to this address. Exactly. And we've wired money. Exactly. And wire transfers work that way as well. Which is well, clearly, right? I mean, they, <laughs> look, my point is that they set up this, what was it, yes. the Venezuelan company yeah. or something like that? There was yeah. a Latin American country yes. uh, company that they set up, and that was their yes. front. Okay. So if you, look, it's not too much of a stretch. You and I could set up a company in anywhere in the world without having to go to that company, right? Okay, so I've got it. if you can already transmit instructions via email today, you could theoretically do that through this data transfer across timelines. I'm cool. Theoretically. Yeah. How do the cars work? Yeah, that well, that's something we discussed yesterday, right? Yeah. After the watch party, which is look, at some point Another this is the Batman paradox. This is why you should join Watch Party, by the way. You can help us explore these issues. This is the Batman paradox. At some point, the infrastructure that you're sending back and creating is so big that people will start to notice. If you don't have invisible cars in your timeline, which of course they didn't. Who's building inv invisible cars? Are you telling me that all cars can be 3D printed? And if so, at some point, someone's going to recognize, I have a the world's first invisible car here. What am I doing working at this like yeah. FedEx store? Yeah, I'd rather just go and steal, sell this technology to Ford and yeah. make a couple billion dollars and call it a day. What is the Batman paradox? The Batman paradox, or not paradox, but the Batman issue was, how does Batman, under his mansion, build a car, have all these batarangs, have a jet plane? It's just him and Alfred. Pennyworth. <laughs> it's just him and Alfred. Yeah. So how is he supposed to have all this technology? At some point, someone's going to realize, someone at Boeing or Airbus is going to recognize, hey... How come we got an order from Bruce Wayne to build a plane in the shape of a bat? And then how come we never see Bruce Wayne and Batman in the same room together? Oh, wait a minute. Wait, Maybe this, Bruce Wayne is Batman. No, this is like this is no, we we got this solved in Better Call Saul. Where, I agree. Right? Where they had the the Germans and housed them on a sure, smaller and scale. Then, and or kill them after. And kill them but after. That's the point. But that's yeah. the point is that that's what I mean. Is it Batman's gadgets get yeah. to such a scale where you have to quite look? You can see Alfred sitting there at night making yeah. a thousand batterings for Batman. Yeah. That's fine. That's small yeah. scale. But when you're starting to talk about jet engines for his bike, for yeah. his car, for his airplane, more than just the two of them are required. So I, the Batman yeah. movies with Christopher Nolan. With Christopher Bale. Yeah. That. Bale, the Bale ones in Christopher Nolan, you're right. Explained it a little bit where he's like, hey, I've got. But even, but even in yeah. that movie, they had to involve Lucius Fox and even he figured it out, right? Yeah. Where he was just like, listen. Yeah. Wayne what Enterprises. What does a billionaire playboy need yeah. a military grade yes. Batmobile for? Correct. Clearly, you're Batman, right? Yeah. And, and he figures it out. Mm -hmm. 
that's my point is that at some point somewhere someone someone along the line has yeah. to figure out what's going on because not everybody is a billionaire so yeah. your average worker is going to figure it out i think the second part of this again join watch party is not only is it the the 3d printing of that but who is driving this because at the end we see this uh irish dude right bob or rob with Tommy, the sheriff, and the sheriff's car gets smashed by this indestructible, invisible, super cool-looking Audi, right? Yeah. Who is driving that car? We'll find out more. That I, That's just a nice cliffhanger. We'll see who else is yeah. out on the field for these guys. Because that cannot be a person. As far as we know, they haven't sent any people back to the future or back to the past. Yeah, here's my here's my you know what my instinct is right hot, now? Hot instinct? What's your hot instinct? It's it's that the Russian guy sent someone back. And he's going to use Tommy as leverage against Flynn. He's definitely not the good guy. Let's put things very clear. They're clearly not telling us everything about what this why this Russian guy wants to be involved. So it's clearly going to be a case where Wilf is getting played by these guys too. Yeah. And then ultimately, I, I just get that feeling. I, I think it's going to be Flynn and Wilf versus these two factions in the future. Mm, I think that's right. Because I, I thought that was a very big issue because, again, I'm not sure who's driving these cars. And the first time, it was like this gang that they the mercenary hits they shot yeah. up right and i could kind of see like okay they gave them they paid them a lot of money they gave them the the cars then they kind of abandoned the cars then, then tommy took both of those cars it does, yeah it's not really clear where tommy put them but he definitely discovered them now someone either has the same car or a new car and they've smashed it and i was thinking look if this is going to be sharice or whatever that new uh, peripheral is, the guy who died, Daniel, they should have just killed Rob or Bob. They shouldn't have taken him from the car. They should have just exactly. like killed him. And they probably and if you leave Tommy alive or dead, that's probably irrelevant. He's collateral. But if you really wanted Bob, you should have taken him. So I agree. I think you made a very good point. I didn't think of it. Kudos to you. I, I agree. That seems to have the Russian Klepp's fingerprints all over it then. But again... That's the beauty of the show, to be determined. I think there's another five episodes to go, and we'll yeah. figure out where it goes from there. What's really interesting for me for this show in particular is, like, normally I like speculating as to where the next episode or where mm -hmm. the series is going. You've seen that. We love to do that with Andor. We love yeah. to do that with, you know, we yeah. love to do that with all these other shows that we've been watching. With this one in particular, though, I think because it's so new and because it's such an unknown IP to me, I think I'm actually kind of happy with them. Just I'm letting them hold my hand and drag me through where I need to go. Yeah. And I'm not so concerned about making guesses as to who's involved and why and how. I'm kind of happy with the show just kind of unfolding. I agree. I mean, it's also very difficult to guess when the rules are not clear, right? Yeah. For a lot of the other Certainly. shows that we watch and we make, we make, you know, like prognostications it's because we know the framework that we can guess within, right? So, like, if, right. if you were to ask, like, where is Alita? It's not clear because it's not clear, like, what the rules are for her. Like, is she just hiding in someone's house? I doubt it. Did she go to a different stub to try to use this technology to, like, erase the technology? Maybe that's more likely. But again, we have no way of knowing what timeline that is in. You know, whether she went to the future or to the past or, or what she's doing, right? Because we don't really know the rules of how she can, how she can move around. But my sense is that still that first episode where it was Flynn's brother and she took him up to that green pyramid, the God font. She said, your eye. And then she's like, your other eye. And it was his real eye. His real eye. Exactly. And to me, that somehow means that like she uploaded the code to him. I mean, it's and that now then we get into pure speculation, which is is he like some type of robot and not a real brother? Is it because of his haptics? Is it because of any other number of things? But 
as, as far as I'm aware, based on that scene, she planted all the information somehow in him. And then she's just like, she went and she killed the, uh, the other peripherals, right? That were responsible for taking the eye in that safe house. And then she just hid somewhere. Yeah. I mean, I, I get the feeling that what could be, it could also be that she has the data and she just doesn't know it. Mm -hmm. I think that, you know, when she scanned the peripherals eye, but it was Flynn. I think that that data is in Flynn's brain. And I think that's why she's been getting the blackouts. Oh, and this quote unquote virus that she's oh, got. Oh, is- I made a very good note. You're a hundred percent right, Pete. A hundred percent right. All numbers approximate. So remember, they went to the doctor. Yeah. And these are the these are the things that Nolan does to lull you to sleep, right? You yeah. kind of want to black out such a mundane the scene. thing, exactly. But they said something, and she said the doctor said, "You've got this bacteria." In your occipital lobe or something like that, right? I don't know how they got that because they were just doing like a spinal tap. But the point was... Oh, no, they did an MRI in the last episode. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But somehow I agree that that bacteria may be not bacteria, but it's the data. Exactly. Because she was like, it's kind of like a viral meningitis kind of thing, but I've never seen this before and certainly not in the occipital nerve. I think that's what happened. When she scanned the eye... Mm-hmm. I think that data got transmitted through the God font, yes. through the peripheral, yes. through the time streams yes. into her brain. Yes. And so she doesn't know it, but she is the carrier of the data. Correct. I agree with you. Makes sense. I can't wait for episode six. I'm really to be determined. Show. Yeah. Yeah. Likewise. I think it's great. I think it's brilliant. I think it's, it's sci-fi that we haven't really seen before, which is rare. So mm-hmm. I like that. Mm-hmm. Okay. Shall we transition to Andor very quickly? Let's Not much to say there, but... Oh, man. I think we've got a lot to say on Andor. What do you think of this? The escape has finally happened. Escape finally happened, but kind of really fast, huh? Like, it I, came out of nowhere. Yeah, I was going to say the same thing, that I was looking forward to... I mean, I remember the when we had the... setup of the heist, right? Remember when we had the eye... And how elaborately planned that was. Yeah. I I thought this was going to be also like super cool. They were going to find a way that they could like walk on the floor and they were going to sneak out through a shaft or something. And instead it was just a, it was just a numbers game. It was not. And it was like almost the most mundane of prison breaks. Yeah. Yeah. I thought it was going to be a little bit more like Ocean's Eleven style, mm-hmm. you know, where they were going yeah. to do fake outs, where they had that, you know, and and as you rightly yeah. pointed out, they did three episodes or two and a half episodes yeah. of setup before the heist in Aldani. Yeah. I thought they would do the same where they were just like, all right, we finally have Andy yeah. Circus on the on board. Yeah. Let's do this. Let's yeah. do the scope outs. Let's, mm-hmm. you know, let's on the back of our food trays, yeah. let's sketch out the plans as yeah. to where everyone's going to yeah. be. And everyone is kind mm-hmm. of sharing information and data in code at yeah. night. And then you have two episodes of this really deep, yes. like, look yeah. behind what, how the mm-hmm. prison works. And yeah. then the breakout in episode 12. Yeah, I was, I was really hoping for something, I agree, something like super cool and just, really interesting and you know cassian kind of noticed like a few things and they took advantage of it and this was it seemed a little anticlimactic because of that it felt a little yeah. unearned i'm not saying it yeah. wasn't unearned i'm just saying it felt a little fast yeah. for what was happening I, not just fast but also i mean i'm really surprised this was a prison that there wasn't like some just simple button that would have like shut all like the blast doors or something, you know, and just cordoned everybody off. I was, I was really surprised everything, like you said, it happened very fast, but no one like sounded an alarm or like tried to close areas off or anything. It was just a little bit like mm, underwhelming to me. That's what I meant by yeah. saying maybe there's not so much to say for Andor uh, in that regard, at least on the, on the, a- a uh, on the Andor escape, side. Yeah. What, what did you think though? Of the speech by Kino Loy. Andy I loved Circus. it. 
I thought it was your typical Andy Circus gravitas. It really, it went from a guy who was just trying to be his usual administrator mm. self, breaking that shackles. Like yeah. you can see the shackles breaking and then him yeah. being this passionate guy. We're never getting out of here alive. So this is our only chance, right? Yeah. I, I have to say the, I read a few online reviews and they were effusive in their praise for the speech. I listened to okay. it. I listened to it again and I thought it was, uh, yeah, I mean, I don't know if it was noteworthy, but I thought no, it was good. Yeah, it was fine. Uh, and then there is a lot about, you know, how he, I don't know if this is really true, but I read something where he was so selfless because he knew that this, uh, what is it? Narkina, Narkina five was in the middle of water. And he knew he couldn't swim, so he knew he'd never be able to escape. But I think that's not true for two reasons, right? One, we know he escapes because we've seen him in Rogue One, right? I thought he's in Rogue One. Is he not? And then the other thing is, like, grab something that can float. <laughs> I mean... Or, no. I mean, certainly if you have... Like, I feel like this is Health and Safety 101. If yeah. you've set up an offshore base... You must have life traps. I, I right? was gonna. I was gonna think like there was. There's got to be like some hovercraft. There's got to be something. But like something for sure, you can just grab a mattress or something's got to be able to float. Like no one's saying that you should just not escape or that you're gonna drown. Just grab something that floats. What about Luthen and his big? speech scene with Lonnie at the end. That's kind of a big reveal, right? What That was a great reveal, by the way. I didn't think that... There was a part of me for a moment that thought that Miro, Amira, that yeah. she was the inside Deidre agent. Amira. I, I thought it prior episodes, not in the last two or three, but like initially when I met her, I thought the same thing. And then at one point, I was thinking that the... Dude that she was always like butting heads with, right? Who didn't think that there was such a big issue. Yeah. On. yeah. But Lonnie. I, I mean, thought he was too obvious because yeah. I, Doc Brown is his real name. But yeah. yes, I thought he was too obvious to be yeah. the, the inside man. Yeah. I thought that that would have been the greatest mm -hmm. reveal was to have someone who's like this hyper focused on success, like almost militant person. Yeah. Also be the one that yeah. actually betrays the empire yeah. from inside. I thought yeah. that would have been great. We had we had we had no reason we had no reason to right. I mean, this is the typical ghost trooper. There's yeah, he cam comes out of nowhere. There's no reason that we could have even guessed him rather than anybody else, right? Exactly. He was such a bland character yeah. in the other episodes that he was just kind of like yeah. he might as well have been background. Yeah, he should have been. It would have been better if they would have given him a little bit more, so it could have been more of a surprise, right? Or not a surprise. But, I mean. I thought that whole scene between him and Luthen was a little bit uncomfortable. And and Yeah, even but I think it was meant to be. It was meant to be, but I love Andor. I mean, I really sincerely love this show because of these details and because of this background. But and this isn't a criticism of the show, this is a a statement about my feelings. When again, when we watched A New Hope, the rebels were good, the Empire was bad, right? Mm -hmm. Same with Return of the Jedi, same with, you know, uh, Empire Strikes Back and Return of the Jedi. The prequels, you know, one, two, and three, fine, it didn't change anything. Rogue One didn't change anything. In Andor, it's really disappointing that. Are the rebels the good guys? I mean, we know the Empire is the bad guy. No one's no one's defending the Empire at all. But are the rebels really good? The, so that's the thing, is that this is why I like the show, is that it's not portraying the rebels yeah. as like these white knights who are yeah. like the saviors of the day. It's showing them to be real life humans who are saying, hey, listen. If we have to dirty our hands, we will. And that's the reason I really like Cassian's in, uh, in Rogue One, right? Because the first time we see Cassian Andor in Rogue One, he kills an informant because he says we cannot sacrifice the mission for one man, which is antithetical to what we see in other 
superhero movies, right? Where, yeah. for no example, Captain behind. America, yeah. No Man Left Behind, and Captain America, most famously in, in in Avengers, says, "We don't trade lives." Yeah. Which is when does he say we'll that? Find, when does he say uh, this that? This is when Vision offers to sacrifice himself. Oh. At the end of Infinity War. God bless. Steve Rogers is so pure, right? He's exactly, but that's what I'm saying is yeah. he's like the embodiment yeah. of purity, right? Don't and that's lives. kind of what we expect from yeah. our good guys, which is hey, mm-hmm. we will not sacrifice our morals and ourselves unless we absolutely have to. And even then, we will never sacrifice our morals. So we will find a solution when, if and when we can and how we can. And if we lose, yeah. we lose together. And Luthen is the opposite though, right? In Luthen's big speech, and again, I watched it a second time. He says, he asks, what did I sacrifice? I sacrificed calm, kindness, kinship, love. Yep. I lost any chance at inner peace. I gave up 50 years. I will be damned for what I do. It's because of my anger, my ego, my eagerness to fight. I will be a savior without even thinking about the cost. He says, I'm condemned to use the tools of my enemy to defeat them. I have lost my decency for someone else's future. There will be no audience to appreciate me. I have sacrificed everything. That's powerful, but do you believe it? You know why I believe it is because he's it was another scene where he's talking about the cost of men, where he's like, it's only 50 men. Yeah. He's putting, he sees that as a negligible cost in the grand scheme of things. And, you know, again, in the grand scheme of things, if you think of like World War I, World War II, etc., what is the cost of 50 men's lives? When you're losing, when you're talking about millions of people's, 50 lives is nothing. But at the end of the day, 50 lives is still 50 lives, right? Even one life is one life. Yeah. And that's his point is that look, in the grand scheme of things, I don't care if we have to lose 50 men for this one operation to succeed because that could result in us saving a billion lives or 10 billion lives. And that's what matters to me. So I think he's all in. And he doesn't care if he goes down in the history books as the most evil or most ruthless man. Yeah. I mean, that's that's very much the opposite of what Steve Rogers would say, right? Exactly. Exactly. Look, they're both on the side of justice. They're both on the side of good. One leans toward saying we were going to find a solution. We believe in ourselves and we believe in other people so much that we'll find a solution to do it without sacrificing lives. Whereas the other says, hey, it's not about believing in ourselves. It's about doing what's right and fast the most efficiently uh, possible. Yeah. Anyway, that was that was kind of the, the big reveal at the end. It was Luthen's uh, speech. And I think then the only other issue, and it was very, very small – was Mon Mothma. Is she yeah. going to be the same as Luthen? Is she gonna Is she gonna go well, with Well we know dude? that she's not really. Yeah. I suspect that she thinks that she's gonna have no choice and I still have hope that she finally ends up getting Jimmy Smith's involved. I also something is going to happen with her husband. I'd, I'm still oh, on totally. the fence. He is either going to surprise her and also be supporting the rebellion, or he is going to turn her in. Yeah, and neither of those would be a shock. I agree. I'm, I mean, and I think they've done it deliberately because then when that dude Davo came, he said, "Like you know, I met your husband a few times." Yeah, it w- it would not be surprising if the husband is like, "Oh, your rebellion." I'm rebellion. I've been doing yeah, this. Yeah, exactly. Like I, for sure. And their love is like he's rekindled. He's got a dark past. Yeah. Yeah. For sure, he's got a shady past. Something going on. But so. I don't see him as if you just with, except for Mon Mothma's comments about him. Do you see him as a bad guy? He's never really no. done anything to deserve a bad reputation, right? He's always been cheery. He's always been like, oh, this is boring, or oh, why are you so serious? Or like he's never I actually that, been 
done anything rude or, or assholish in any episode, right? You're right that way, but I think that it's just the expectation of the husband or wife of a politician is to kind of be like super cheery, super enthusiastic, and super involved and supportive. And one thing is for sure, he does not seem like a supportive guy. And moreover, we saw that he is openly willing to pit his their daughter against the mother, right? We saw that in the first episode. Yeah. Yeah. I think also because it's Mon Mothma and I have like nostalgia for Mon Mothma, yeah. I automatically side with her <laughs> over yeah. her husband who's been portrayed as maybe not the best of yeah. guys. Okay. Maybe. So this is episode 10. We've got two more, right? That's right. Oh, all right. Stay tuned. Okay, so that is The Peripheral and Andor episode 10. Join us next Friday for our next watch party, episode six of The Peripheral. If you guys have an idea as to what's going to happen in Andor, or if you have any comments or thoughts about this, let us know. Drop us a comment at this video, like and subscribe. Send us an email, aloha at filmsandstuffpodcast.com, or tweet at us at FNS Podcast. We shall be here. Pete, pleasure as always. Listeners, thank you for listening. Have a lovely day ahead, everybody. Thanks, Ethan. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Thank you for listening to another episode of Films and Stuff. If you haven't already, please subscribe and review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever podcasts are downloaded. Films and Stuff. There is no substitute.